This morning's sermon will be the sixth in our series entitled The End Times According to Jesus. Now, the focus of this series is supposed to be on the Olivet Discourse. You see, the Olivet Discourse is about the end times. What happened is that four of Jesus' disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they came to Jesus and they asked him three specific questions. All three questions pertain to the end times, or what they perceive to be the end times. And Jesus' response to those questions is known as the Olivet Discourse, because his response occurred on the Mount of Olives. Therefore, it's called the Olivet Discourse. So in essence, the Olivet Discourse is Jesus' teaching on the end times. It's quite lengthy. It actually covers three chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 23, 24, and 25. Now, I hate to admit it, but so far we haven't even looked at the Olivet Discourse. But there's a good reason for that. You see, eschatology is a very difficult subject because to really understand it, you must have a comprehensive understanding of God's Word. In other words, you need a good knowledge of the entire Bible, not just the New Testament. You need a good knowledge of the Old Testament. That's why so few pastors actually teach on eschatology. They don't have an adequate database of knowledge on the Old Testament. And as a result, most of you grew up in churches where the pastor never taught on the subject. Therefore, you have a very limited knowledge of eschatology. And I know that if I go too deep, too fast, or I use terms that you're not familiar with, then I'll lose you and you'll lose interest in this. And it's really not that difficult to grasp. The only problem is you got to come on a regular basis, or if you miss, you got to go back and listen to the sermons. They are standalone sermons, but still, I'm building on the information that I give previously. So, what I decided to do, because most people don't know much about eschatology, is I decided to give you some basic information that you need to know before we jumped into Jesus' teaching on the end times. So, for the first three weeks of this series, I talked about the rapture. In the fourth week sermon, I turned my attention to Daniel's prophecy known as the 70 weeks. And after this morning's sermon, we'll have spent three weeks on it. We still won't be finished. I'll have one more sermon to go as we still talk about the Antichrist. Now, it might sound like four weeks on one particular prophecy is a lot of time, but it's really not. Not when you consider how important this prophecy is when it comes to eschatology. You see, this prophecy, known as the 70 weeks of Daniel, is the key to understanding the mystery of the end times. So it's crucial that you understand it. In fact, let me just say this. If you don't understand it, you'll never get eschatology. You'll never know what's really going to go on in the end times. You'll just parrot what other people say. It's that important. In fact, Jesus alludes to this specific prophecy several times in the Olivet Discourse. Because, as I said, it is the key to understanding the mystery of the end times. And it's only four verses. Verses 24, 25, 26, and 27, and Daniel chapter 9. But these four verses are so packed with critical and useful information that without them, we wouldn't have a clue as to what's going to happen in the future. Seriously. Too many pieces of the puzzle would be missing. In fact, these four verses are the most important pieces to the puzzle. And I can't emphasize that enough. So let's read these four verses. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Now, the seven weeks and the 62 weeks run consecutively. In other words, there's not a gap in between them. So the reason he broke it up is because it took seven weeks to rebuild Jerusalem. And when I say weeks, I'm not talking about what we think of as a week. I'm using that, that Hebrew word, Shabuah, which is seven years. So actually, it took 49 years to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. But the seven weeks and the 62 weeks run consecutively. Let's keep going. The streets shall be built again in the wall, even in troubles, troubles, troublous times. And after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. 
but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and even at the end there will be war, and desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. And at the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now that sounds really difficult to understand, but it's not. I've torn it apart. We're going to continue on. I'm going to show you it's very easy to understand. In fact, to help you understand the gist of this prophecy, let me give you a simple outline of these four verses. Verse 24 explains the purpose of the 70 weeks. Verse 25 foretells the coming of the Messiah at the end of the 69 weeks. Now, if you notice, it said 62, but those run consecutively. So seven weeks and 62 is 69 weeks. So verse 25 foretells the coming of the Messiah at the end of the 69 weeks. Verse 26 is the interval. Verse 26 reveals an interval between the 69 weeks and the 70th week. Everyone knows what an interval is, right? An interval is a space between two things, a gap. So what we're saying is that there's a space of time or a gap of time between the 69 weeks and the 70th week. Verse 27 is about the Antichrist and his role in the tribulation. Now, let me go through this outline real quick. All right. As I said, verse 24 explains the purpose of the 70 weeks. Look at verse 24 again. Seventy weeks are determined upon my people and upon my holy city to, one, finish the transgression, and two, make an end of sins, and three, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and four, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and five, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and six, to anoint the moist holy. Now, that's not just religious words that sound very spiritual. No, no. There's meaning packed into this. In fact, you need to keep in mind that the focus of this prophecy is on the Jews, not the church. So with that in mind, the purpose of the 60 weeks is to accomplish six things. First of all, to finish the transgression. Actually, transgression in the Hebrew means rebellion. Secondly, to make an end of sins. Thirdly, to make an atonement for iniquity. Fourthly, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Fifthly, to seal up prophecy. And last but not least, to anoint the holy place. Now, the first three things were accomplished at Jesus' first coming through his death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. If you look at that list, those first three things were accomplished through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. However, because the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, they have not appropriated what Christ has done for them. But during the tribulation, their eyes are going to be opened, and they're going to then realize that Jesus was the Messiah, and they will appropriate what Christ has done for them. The last three things will be accomplished when Christ returns at the end of the 70th week. You see, everlasting righteousness is a Hebraism that refers to the millennium. So to bring in everlasting righteousness means to usher in the millennium. And Christ will do that when he returns. To seal up prophecy means to bring all prophecy to its final fulfillment. And that happens during the millennium. Every promise and every prophecy will be fulfilled. You know, there are those who don't believe in the millennium. Well, if you don't believe in the millennium, then God's a liar. All of the promises, all of the prophecies that he's given are not going to be fulfilled. But people, God's not a liar. So every promise, every prophecy that he's made will be fulfilled during the millennium. And last but not least, the temple of the Messianic kingdom will be built and anointed by the Lord himself, just as Ezekiel prophesied. Yeah, that's what it means to, when it says to anoint the holy place. Now, verse 25 foretells the coming of the Messiah at the end of the 69 weeks. Look at verse 25 again. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, 69 weeks. Now, the Hebrew word or the word weeks is translated from the Hebrew word Shabuah, which simply means seven. It can refer to seven days, seven weeks, seven months or seven years, depending upon the context. 
But in this context, it's referring to years. So what verse 25 is saying is that from the time the decree is given to rebuild the city of Jerusalem until the Messiah officially reveals himself will be 69 seven-year periods, or in other words, 483 years. And there's 360 days in a prophetical years. So that's 173,880 days. Now, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem was given on March the 14th, 445 B.C. So according to Daniel, the Messiah would officially reveal himself on April the 6th, 32 A.D., which was the exact day Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Now, verse 26 is the interval. Look at verse 26 again. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And even unto the end there will be war, and desolations are determined. Now, the word after means after. So, the events in verse number 26 occur after the 69 weeks, but before the 70th week. Let me say that again. The events in verse 26 occur after the 69 weeks, but before the 70th week. The Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. And the city of Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. And it happened in 70 A.D., 38 years after the Messiah appeared and was cut off. So as you can see, there's an interval between 69 weeks and the 70 weeks. And how long is that interval? How long is that gap of time? Well, we know that it's at least, at least 2,000 years, because when the Babylonian captivity ended on July 23rd, 537 B.C., the Jews still owed God 2,520 years of servitude according to Ezekiel. In prophetical years, it's 2,483 years, nine months, and 21 days. And we know that the 70th week would not begin until Israel's servitude was over. Let me say that again. We know that the 70th week would not begin until Israel's servitude was over. So when was it over? May 14th. 1948, the very day that modern Israel became a nation. Is that a coincidence? No. The day Israel's servitude was over was also the day that Israel became a nation, symbolizing that the fig tree has bloomed and designating us as the generation that will see his return. We are the generation. And how long is a prophetical generation? 100 years. 100 years. We are the generation. If you're born after 1948 and you live long enough, you will see the return of Jesus Christ. And people, that's what we covered last week. So now, that's just an introduction. We're ready to move on and look at verse 27, which is about the Antichrist. So look at verse 27. And he, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Shabuah. What's one week? Seven years. And in the midst, or the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Anyone know what an oblation is? An oblation is something that you offer to God. So actually what it's saying is the sacrifices and offerings will cease. And at the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out upon him. Now, as you can see from the first part of verse number 27, the Antichrist negotiates a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. People, that's what starts the tribulation. Listen to me. The tribulation does not begin when the rapture occurs. How many of you were taught that? When the rapture occurs, the tribulation begins. No, no, no. There's going to be a gap of time between the rapture and when the tribulation begins. How long will it be? I don't know. Personally, I think it'll be a very short time. Yeah. But the tribulation begins with the signing of the seven-year peace treaty. That's what starts the 70th week. And for those of you who haven't picked up on this yet, the 70th week is the tribulation. 
And how long is a week? Seven years. That's how we know that the tribulation will last for seven years. That's confirmed as we go through the Bible, other places in Daniel, Jesus confirms that also in the book of Revelation, when it tells us that for three and a half years, everything's fine because of this peace treaty, the Antichrist comes in in the middle of it, and then he sets up this sacrilegious object in the Holy of Holies. As a result of that, the treaty is, is broken, and as a result of that, he turns on the Jews, and you got another three and a half years until Christ returns. Revelation tells us that. So all of this is confirmed in other places and other prophecies. Now, look back at verse 27. Let's read it again, except this time, let's read it in the NLT, the New Living Translation, because it's a little easier to understand. The ruler, the Antichrist, will make a treaty with the people of Israel for a period of seven years. But after half this time, he will put an end to all the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out upon him. Now again, once this peace treaty is signed, the tribulation begins, which is the 70th week. I know I keep saying it, but I want you to get this. The 70th week is the tribulation. But what's interesting is that God refers to this treaty as a treaty with death. Yeah. You see, the reason that Israel agrees to this peace treaty is because they want to live in peace with their enemies. And they think that by signing this treaty, they're going to get the peace that they so desperately want. But God knows the truth. He knows that by signing this treaty with the Antichrist, they're actually signing their death warrant. It's not a treaty guaranteeing them life, safety, and peace. No, it's just the opposite. It's a treaty that guarantees their demise. Turn to Isaiah chapter 28, verses 14 through 22, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. How many of you read your Bible through in a year? You read through the book of Isaiah, you come to this section, and you probably just read over it. You thought you can't understand it. Today, you're going to understand it. And you're going to see it's referring to the tribulation. Notice what this says. This is Isaiah chapter 28, verses 14 through 22. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant treaty with death. And with Sheol, we have made a pact. The overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by, for we have made a falsehood our refuge, and we have concealed ourselves with deception. Now, let me explain what this means here. Israel is surrounded by Muslim countries. And every Muslim country around them wants to exterminate the Jews. They want to push them into the Mediterranean Sea. They want to, they just totally want to annihilate and wipe out the Jews. And so many times what they do is they refer to death all around them. And so one of the things that takes place is they're going to make a treaty with death. In other words, these Muslim nations. And then with Shio, they're going to make a pact. And then this is what they say. The overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by, for we've made our falsehood, made falsehood our refuge, and we have concealed ourselves with deception. In other words, we're deceiving ourselves. Now let's keep going. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. And I will make justice the measuring light and righteousness the level. Now, who is the cornerstone? Jesus. Jesus. And all who believes in it will not be disturbed. In other words, when this overwhelming scourge comes through, they won't be disturbed. Why? Because they're no longer there. The rapture has occurred and they're in heaven with Jesus. Yeah. But here's what's interesting is this cornerstone. I love this in verse 17. And I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the level. The measuring line is a plumb line. And it's saying the plumb line is going to be justice. The level is righteousness. The plumb line is vertical. The level is horizontal. And the cornerstone has to be perfect to hold everything up. And you know what it's saying? Jesus is just and he's righteous. And everything stands on him. They rejected the cornerstone. But... We won't get into that right now. Let's just keep reading. Then hell shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the secret place. And your covenant treaty with death shall be canceled. 
Yeah, they're going to make this seven-year peace treaty, but God tells them, here's what you don't know. You think you're making this so you can live, but it's going to be canceled. And your pack with shields shall not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, then you become its trampling place. What you thought you were getting out of, you become the target of. As often as it passes through, it will seize you. From morning after morning, it will pass through any time during the day or night, and it will be sheer terror to understand what it means. The bed is too short on which to stretch out, and the blanket is too small to wrap its oneself in. Ever been in that situation? The bed's too short. The blanket's not big enough. Yeah. For the Lord will rise up at Mount Perizim. He will be stirred up as in the valley of Gibeah to do his task. Now, the Lord's going to do this. The Lord's going to do his task, his alien task, and to work his work, his strange work. And doubt now do not carry on as scoffers, lest your fetters be made stronger, for I have heard from the Lord God of hosts of decisive destruction on all the earth. Yeah, God's going to do an alien work, a strange work. He's going to bring his wrath upon the entire earth. Yes, we've suffered tribulation before. If you're born into this earth, you're born to suffer tribulation, but not like the tribulation of the seven years, because it's the wrath of God poured up on all of the earth. Now, the phrases overwhelming scourge, alien task, strange work are just different names for the tribulation. Let me say that again. The phrases overwhelming scourge, alien task, and strange work are just different names for the tribulation. So we know for a fact that this treaty is referring to the treaty in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. The only difference is this passage from Isaiah is looking at the treaty from God's perspective. You see, Daniel 9, 27 looks at the treaty from man's perspective, but Isaiah looks at it from God's perspective. And what God is saying is that by making this treaty with countries that are committed to your demise, these Muslim countries, Israel is fooling itself into believing that it's going to have peace and security. But all it's really doing is signing a treaty with death, for they've just signed the treaty that begins the tribulation. And at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist will commit the abomination of desolation. Now, we'll talk about the abomination of desolation in just a second, but let's keep going because I want you to understand why God says that this treaty is a treaty with death. Now, once the Antichrist commits the abomination of desolation, he then turns on the Jews and pours his wrath upon them. As Isaiah says, he cancels their treaty. So this treaty with death is canceled, and over two-thirds of the Jews will be massacred and um, only a third will make it out alive. Look at Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. Two-thirds of the people in the land will be cut off and die, says the Lord, but one-third will be left in the land. I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. I will refine them like silver and purify them like goat. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, these are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. Now, if you read this in context, you'll see that it's referring to the last days, also known as the end times. So what it says is that two-thirds of the Jews will die during the tribulation, but a remnant one-third will survive. And that remnant will repent for rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, and they will call upon Jesus to return and save them, and he will because that's the prerequisite for his return. We're going to find out when we study the Olivet Discourse that when he looks at Jerusalem, he tells them because the Jewish leaders have rejected him. And he says, I will not return until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And that's a Messianic song. What Jesus is saying to the Jewish leaders is, I will not return until you recognize me as the Messiah, until you put your trust in me and you call upon me to come. Yeah. The Jews must repent for rejecting Jesus the Messiah and cry out for him to return. Look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look to me whom they have pierced. Who's that? Jesus. 
and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him because they miss the Messiah, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. When that happens, Jesus will return. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Look at verse 27 again, Daniel chapter 9, and let's see what the Antichrist does when he breaks the treaty. Yeah, the ruler, the Antichrist, will make a treaty with the people of Israel for a period of seven years. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. The first thing that he does is he puts an end to the sacrifices and offerings, which tells us that part of the conditions of this treaty is that Israel is allowed to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. And they're also allowed to reinstitute the sacrificial system. But after three and a half years, he cancels it. He stops it. In fact, all Jewish worship at the temple is stopped. Daniel chapter 7, verse number 25, gives us a little more insight into how he stops it and what he does. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And he, the Antichrist, shall speak great words against the Most High. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand into a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, you notice it says three and a half years. Where do we get that three and a half years? Time is singular. Times is a duel. It's not plural. How many of you know what a duel is? We don't really use a duel in English. We only have one word that uses a duel in English. Anyone know what that word is? Both. Both. If you come to me and you say, hey, pastor, do you want Lay's potato chips, Frito corn chips, or Doritos? And I look at you and I say, I want both of them. You're going to go, well, which two? Why would you say that? Because I said both. Both means more than one, but it doesn't mean more than two. It's a duel. That's probably the only word that I know of, I could think of, that English uses as a duel, but every language, most languages have duels, and it, Hebrew does. And so it uses a time, singular, and times, and it's used as a duel. So that's two. Two and one is three. And the dividing of time, which is half. So three and a half years. Now, contrary to what most people think, speaking great words against the Most High doesn't just mean he's blaspheming. It means that he's proclaiming to be God, or he's proclaiming to be just as great as God. So this refers to the abomination of desolation. Notice what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. He, talking about the Antichrist, will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. Yeah so that he sets himself up in God's temple, referring to the Holy of Holies, proclaiming himself to be God. People, that is the abomination of desolation. Halfway through the tribulation, three and a half years into it, the Antichrist enters the Holy of Holies, and he claims or he proclaims to be God. Yeah. And then, of course, because he doesn't stay there, he sets up a sacrilegious object in the Holy of Holies, but he's desecrated it. That's the abomination of desolation. But not only is he going to proclaim himself to be God, but according to Daniel 7.25, he's also going to change the times and the laws. Look at the last part of verse 25. This is Daniel chapter 7. And he, the Antichrist, shall speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Wear out means he's going after them to kill them. And think to change times and laws. Now, the phrase times and laws is a figure of speech. You see, rabbis refer to the Sabbath and the three feasts, the spring feast, the summer feast, and the fall feast. We know them as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. They refer to those the Sabbath and those three feasts as times because God set specific times for men to observe those holy days. So the Sabbath and the three Jewish feasts were referred to as times. Look at Deuteronomy 16, 16. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Three times in a year. 
shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is actually three feasts in one, Feast of Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, and in the Feast of Weeks, which we know as the Feast of Pentecost, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is three feasts in one, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of uh, the uh, Great Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. But they'll just refer to them as these three feasts. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Now, the law refers to the Levitical law. In other words, the laws of God that are outlined in the book of Leviticus. You see, in the book of Leviticus, you'll find the different types of sacrifices and offerings that were to be offered to God and how to perform them. You had to do it the way God said. It also detailed what's considered to be clean and unclean, and it also outlined the specific duties of the priest. So he's going to change the Jewish times and the Levitical law. Now, let me explain what that means. Again, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, we're told that this Antichrist is going to make a seven-year peace treaty with Israel, and he's, allow, he's going to allow them to rebuild the temple. But after three and a half years, he's going to break the treaty. And when he breaks the treaty, he's going to stop the Jews from offering their sacrifices to God. And he'll set up a sacrilegious object, object in the temple and tell them to worship it. People, that's changing the Levitical laws. And in his desire to annihilate all Jewish institutions, he'll even change the Sabbath and the Jewish feast. That's what verse 25 means when it says, <coughs> excuse me, he'll change the times and the laws. He'll stop the sacrifices and oblations, and he'll set up a religious system that's totally contrary to the Levitical law, and he'll change the Sabbath and the three Jewish feasts to something else. What do you think he's going to change them to? Would you like to know my opinion? He's going to change the Sabbath to Friday and the feast to Ramadan. I'll stop right there. Yeah. You'll see why I say that when I speak next time. Now, look back at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. The ruler, Antichrist, will make a treaty with the people of Israel for a period of seven years. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out upon him. In other words, he'll enter into the Holy of Holies, sit on the mercy seat, and proclaim himself to be God. That's the abomination of desolation. And then he's going to, when he leaves it, he's going to set up a sacrilegious object in the Holy of Holies, and he cancels all of the things that the Jews do, people that desecrates the holy place. And then he turns on the Jews. And people, that's what Revelation is all about. If you went through my series with Revelation, you know most of this in detail. Now, how many of you are visual learners? You kind of tuned me out as I went through all this. Yeah. It's like, this is just names and numbers, and oh my gosh, how does he keep all that straight? Right? Okay, if you're a visual learner, let me give you an eschatological timeline based on the 70-week prophecy. This is my own personal one. You won't find it out there. Hopefully, we can put this PDF on the uh, website, but let me show you this eschatological timeline. Here's what Daniel says. We got verse 25, verse 26, and verse number 27. But verse number 25 tells us, For from the time the decree is given to rebuild the city of Jerusalem until the Messiah comes and officially reveals himself will be seven and 62 weeks. In other words, 69 weeks, which is 483 years. There's 60, there is a 360 days in a prophetical year, so that's 173,880 days. Do we know when the decree was given to rebuild Jerusalem? Yes, we do. It was March the 14th, 445 B.C. So from the time that decree was given until the Messiah appears right here, he's revealed, will be a period of 483 years or 173,880 days. That would be from this time to this time, April 6, 32 AD. That's the exact day that Jesus revealed himself. 
For no other reason, every Jew should have accepted Jesus as the Messiah if they believed that Daniel was the prophet. All they had to do was count the days because Daniel told them. Yes. So the Jews missed his first visitation, his first coming. Now, verse 26 is the interval. It tells us that after the 69 weeks, but before the 70th week, certain things will happen. First of all, the Messiah who officially revealed himself on April the 6th, 32 AD, will be cut off. In Hebrew, that means will be killed, will be murdered. Jesus was put to death four days later on April the 10th, 32 AD. Exactly what Daniel prophesied. And then it says, the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the temple. That happened in 70 AD. But he told us these things happen, these events happen after verse 25, after the 69 weeks, but before the 70th week, which is the tribulation. So we know that there's an interval. There's a space of time or a gap of time between when Jesus came the first time and when the tribulation begins. But how long is that gap of time? Well, this is the one thing we didn't learn from Daniel, but we learned from Ezekiel. Ezekiel was told by God to lay on his side so many days on his left and to lay on his side so many days on his right. And each, time, each day that he laid on his side represented one year. And he said, because of the people's sin, they're going to have to, or they owe me, these many years of servitude. And so what we find out is they haven't paid their years of servitude. And it's actually seven times more because they rebelled against God. And Leviticus tells us that. So, how long is this interval, the space of time between when the Messiah first came and the tribulation begins, and which the Messiah will come at the end of it? Well, we know that they came out of the Babylonian captivity on July 23rd, 537 B.C. That's when it ended. But they still owed God 2,520 years of servitude. And let me ask you this. Is God going to do these great things for Israel until they paid their debt? No, 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 no. God doesn't do that. Because the plumb line is just and the level is righteousness. So now they're going to have to pay this. So from this time here, there's 2,520 years of servitude they still owe God. So when we count that off, and we can convert that to days, and we convert that to years, months, and dates, and we find out that on May the 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation. The very day that they paid off their debt to God in years of servitude. Wow. Is that a coincidence? No. The very day that they paid off their debt to God in years of servitude is the very day they became a nation. And as a result of that, it symbolizes the fig tree blooming because Israel has been dead. There have been little periods of recovery, but they were not a true nation, sovereign unto themselves from the time they came out of the Babylonian captivity until May 14th, 1948. That's when the fig tree blooms. And what we're going to find out when we get to the Olivet Discourse is Jesus says, this generation that sees the fig tree bloom, my coming is at the doorstep. It's near. This generation will not pass. So we know that it had to go, this interval had to go all the way to May 14th, 1948. But we also know the fig tree bloomed we're the final generation. We don't know when it's going to start. But we do know the rapture occurs first because that which is restraining the Antichrist has to be removed. And what's restraining the Antichrist? Some people say it's the Holy Spirit. No, it's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is everywhere at all times. When the church is raptured, the Holy Spirit's still there. How in the world are the Jews going to open their eyes? How in the world are you going to have all this great 
revival that's going to take place. No, no, no. What's the restrainer? The church. Not all of those, not all of you that plays church, but the true church. We're the soul we preserve. We understand what the LGBTQ agenda is all about. Yeah. We understand what critical race theory is. We understand what socialism is. We understand that abortion is murder. And as a result of that, we stand for certain things. But let me tell you, when the church is taken out of the way with a rapture, all you've got left is people who are immoral. And the Antichrist is ready to move into his position because that which restrains the church is taken away. And when that takes place, he has a peace treaty he signs for one week. One Shabuwa, period of seven years. And he signs this peace treaty with Israel. That's what Daniel 9, 27 tells us, verse 27. But in the middle of this week, three and a half years into it, he stops it. He comes in, stops all of the sacrifices and offering. He cancels the treaty and he turns on the Jews. And the whole purpose of this time of Jacob's trouble is for the Jews to realize that we missed it. What were we thinking? Jesus was the Messiah. It will drive them to their knees. It will drive them back to the Word of God. They'll realize and recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. And as Zechariah says, they will look upon him whom they pierced. They will mourn for him. They'll beg for him to return. And guess what? Jesus returns to rescue Israel at the end of the 70th week and usher in the millennium to bring in the, those things, last three things that are the purpose of the 70 weeks. Is that a better explanation for those of you who are visual? All right. Hopefully you get that a little bit better than me getting. But if you watch this several times, go back and watch the sermon, get it in your spirit, understand it, turn to those scriptures, listen to what I'm saying. Pretty soon you go, yeah, I get it. And then when we come to the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is going to make reference to this prophecy. He's going to keep referring back to it. Why? Because Daniel chapter 9, these four verses, but actually three, 25, 26, and 27, are the key to understanding the mystery of the end times. 